ask all of our panelists to please uh, join us on the platform uh, here and take a comfortable seat. And uh, we'll take a few minutes to uh, get ready. Bring your coffee, water, um, whatever you like. So I'd like to welcome everyone uh, to this uh, session. It's a little bit different from uh, the other cell-based therapies that we've been talking about at this meeting. Um, instead of, uh, but not completely, uh, but instead of the regenerative medicine using uh, stem cells, we're talking about uh, a different kind of stem cell and a different kind of therapy for cancer. And so uh, there are uh, today three main modalities for cancer treatment. They're chemotherapy, radiation, and surgery. And as you all know, uh, they all have uh, uh, very uh, devastating side effects, even though they're effective, uh, and will continue to use those therapies because they work, but they don't work for all the patients. So the, the question is, what can we do to help the patients who don't respond to conventional therapy? And so this session is about a new modality uh, that's really, it's not entirely new. It does have a history, which you're gonna hear about from our speakers, but uh, it's having a renaissance now. Uh, and so it's a very exciting time in cancer immunotherapy, and I'm going to let our speakers uh, tell you all about it. So uh, first we're going to start with uh, Dr. Michael Lotz from the University of Pittsburgh, uh, one of the leading uh, surgical oncologists and uh, stem cell, uh, pardon me, uh, cancer immunotherapist. Uh, in, in, uh, for the several decades uh, now. Uh, so uh, please welcome uh, Dr. Lotz. Thank you. Okay. Is this it? Okay. So uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, we'll have a chance to talk a little bit about uh, what has been one of the most extraordinary sea changes that I've seen in my career as an oncologist and as a tumor immunologist. The field of oncology is absolutely changed course. There is no going back. Immunotherapy is here to stay. And even as a surgeon, and over half of patients with cancer are still cured primarily by surgical excision, uh, I believe that one of the primary modalities that is going to supplant many of the others is immunotherapy, but probably in combination with uh, chemotherapy and uh, radiation therapies. So let me uh, go ahead and get started. Uh, I am uh, a professor of surgery immunology and bioengineering at the University of Pittsburgh. Some of you may recognize this cartoon. This is Calvin and Hobbes. Uh, Calvin's looking up at the sky and says, where, where do we go when we die? And they think about it a little bit and to say Pittsburgh. And um, since I've been at the University of Pittsburgh for 26 years, that thought had occurred to me. Uh, and the last panel, uh, Calvin says, do you mean if we're good or if we're bad? Uh, and uh, Steve, who I see in the audience, is somebody who escaped Pittsburgh, so he'll likely die somewhere else, I would guess. Um, so, uh, for the last several months, I've been at a company called Lion Biotechnologies. Uh, this is a company designed uh, to develop uh, tumor infiltrating lymphocyte therapy. I'm going to talk about that, but primarily the work done at the uh, National Cancer Institute, my former mentor, Steve Rosenberg. Uh, but I thought, given that there might be a mixed audience here, that I would talk a little bit very briefly about the history and how I think about immunology in broad strokes as an introduction. 
So as you may know, the planet Earth is about uh, four, four and a half billion years old. We've had life on this planet about three and a half billion years. Innate immune mechanisms by far are the most highly evolved uh, immune mechanisms that we have. There's about three and a half billion years of evolution. And the relative new guy on the block is adaptive immune response. And those are T cells and B cells. And although we used to draw the line uh, with all these blue down here up to uh, humans at the bottom, uh, with a dividing line between the uh, jawless fishes, the lamprey, and the sharks. In actual fact, we recognize that the lamprey has an adaptive immune response. It's just uh, homologous to what we have uh, in mammalian species. So I want to take the fear out of immunology. Uh, some of you may recognize this cartoon, M&Ms. Uh, you have this th thin uh, uh, bit of hard candy on the outside and a dark chocolate core. Most of our immunology is innate, and the next two speakers are going to be talking about innate immunity as part of their dialogue. And there's this, this thin veneer of adaptive immunity on the outside. Uh, but do not be afraid. Immunology is your friend. Um, some of you may be familiar uh, with Bob Weinberg, also a Pittsburgher. He grew up in Shadyside. He and Doug Hanahan, now in Lausanne, uh, several years ago put together what they considered to be the hallmarks of cancer, and uh, then uh, had a chance 10 years later to put the revised hallmarks and brought in to the uh, joy of immunologists everywhere two notions that we've been championing, that tumors have learned how to avoid immune destruction, and much of the checkpoint era that we currently have in front of us uh, is a consequence of one of the mechanisms by which tumors avoid immune destruction. And the other is, is that in actual fact, virtually all adult cancers, not pediatric cancers, arise in the setting of chronic inflammation. And in fact, uh, inflammation promotes the emergence of tumors in adults. And you might even think of cancer as the end stage of chronic inflammation. So um, uh, one other uh, process that some of you may be familiar with is apoptosis. There are three kinds of apoptosis, intrinsic, extrinsic, and um, um, cytolytic. Uh, the third one, mediated by, mediated by T cells and NK cells by delivering uh, granzymes and other pro-apoptotic proteins through perforant pores. But this is counterbalanced by an alternative, instead of programmed cell death, so-called programmed cell survival, with a process that won the Nobel Prize this last year, known as autophagy, literally self-eating, so that in the setting of stress, when indeed cancer is a stressed cell, you have both increased apoptotic pathways and increased autophagic pathways. And what happens next is largely dependent on other signals that the cells receive. And so in the setting of chemotherapy, hypoxia, uh, starvation, which is a commonplace in uh, tumor evolution, you have both of these processes going on, both of them counter-inhibiting each other. And what happens next, death or adaptation, is totally dependent on these other factors. And in the setting of cancer, where you acquire apoptotic defects, such as P53 loss or mutation, or upregulation of BCL2, BCLXL, IAPS, and survivance, you are tilted way over to the side of autophagy. And as a consequence, you adapt, and when you die, you die a terrible, horrible, awful, screaming out loud, blood in the street kind of death called necrosis, releasing what are called DAMPs, damage associated molecular pattern molecules, including ATP, HMGB1, histones, DNA itself, et cetera, which recruits these inflammatory cells. And that's all you really need to know to understand a basis for tumor immunology. Cancer is just as much a disorder of cell death as it is a disorder of cell growth. Now we know there, uh, death used to be a lot simpler. There are new forms of cell death that I don't have time to talk about. Iron dependent uh, lipid oxidation, ferroptosis, rip kinase dependent cell death, necroptosis, or one of my favorite, entosis, where one other cell cannibalizes a cell while it's still alive called entosis. And so there's a lot to know about cell death. Oh, um, let me just go back, whoops. Um, uh, and just say that uh, one of the consequences in the uh, disordered tumor microenvironment is that NK cells and T cells arriving in that environment are awash in a sea of 
garbage coming from dead and dying cells, including not only the molecules I mentioned, but also potassium cations that are at much higher concentration inside the cell, work of Nick Restifo at the NCI. And these cells are actually paralyzed and unable to mediate their important anti-tumor effects through something that I call lymphoplegia, along, you know, it's comparable to uh, quadriplegia or paraplegia. So what evidence do we have that immune cells is, are important in the setting of cancer? There's hundreds, if not thousands, of examples. I pick one from my colleague, uh, Stu Grossman at the um, uh, Johns Hopkins, who looked at patients with high-grade gliomas, uh, resected pancreatic cancer, uh, I can't even read my own slides, uh, whatever that is, uh, stage three non-smell cell lung cancer, et cetera, and looked at if you drove the lymphocyte count down to what's called grade three or four lymphopenia, below 500 cells per millimeter uh, cubed, all of these patients who had uh, low lymphocyte counts had a much worse prognosis than those who did not. And that's probably as good an evidence that I'm aware of that our current therapies are actually diminishing an immune response. Some of you may be familiar with this slide. Again, it's not going to be uh, visible uh, from the back of the room, but it's a paper that came out from Lawrence et al. in Nature in 2013, which shows a six-decade log scale on the side, and then along the uh, abscissa, all the individual tumor types, ranging from pediatric tumors, thyroid cancer, AML, at the low mutational load burden, all the way up to six decade log higher, six log higher mutational load in tumors like melanoma, uh, lung cancer, esophageal cancer, and a subset of colorectal cancers. And so uh, we now know that these uh, mutated um, uh, genes are associated with the creation of neoepitopes, things that T cells can recognize, and indeed much of our success for checkpoint inhibitors or adoptive immunotherapy has been in the setting of these high mutational load tumors. But as you can see, there's a large number of other tumors uh, types which don't fit into this high load. And the question is, where do they sit? And I believe that this group of tumors, ones which are in the middle range, we need to provoke an effective immune response through macro targeting macrophages or NK cells. And then uh, pediatric tumors and other tumor types for which there is a low mutational load, consider targeted therapy. We actually go after those driver mutations. Uh, and that's a hypothesis, not a fact. So if you look at uh, the modern era of checkpoints, and I'll come back to this a little bit later, and you look at this mutational load across the uh, abscissa and the overall response rate to checkpoint inhibition, you can see that the tumors up at the top, uh, which are MSI high colorectal cancer, melanoma, and Merkel cancer, are really not only have the highest mutational load, but also have the highest response to checkpoints. There's a large group in the middle, and then there's a group at the bottom. I plan on getting prostate cancer since all old men get prostate cancer, and I plan to be an old man, uh, has a very low uh, response rate uh, to checkpoints, as do uh, some of the sarcomas and uh, non-MSI high colorectal cancer. What do we do with those? So uh, I just want to remind you, for those of you who grew up in a more modern era, that the first 37 years of UA immunotherapy before checkpoint cars, what I call paleoimmunology, uh, that we've had a period for, uh, of immunotherapy that actually predated the modern era. I started my career working with Steve Rosenberg, giving IL-2 activated killer cells, we called lax cells, back in the late 70s. I started giving, uh, when I joined the senior staff, high dose IL-2, which is now approved for patients with melanoma and kidney cancer in the mid 80s. Uh, Suzanne Tabalian launched her career with me uh, and she took over my lab when I left the NIH in, 19, er, in 1990, uh, growing tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, but went on to do uh, important work that I'm sure uh, you know about with checkpoint inhibitors. Yutaka Kawakami did the first IL-4 therapies with me at the NIH. Uh, they themselves didn't bear up, but he was able to go on and clone the individual melanosomal antigens. Mike Atkins and I championed a swing and a miss, IL-12, and we can talk about why that didn't become a therapeutic in the uh, mid-90s. Hideaki Tahara uh, drove IL-12 gene therapy. My colleague, Olia Finn, who worked with Richard for a while, and I uh, decided we were going to cure cancer with dendritic cells, uh, something that has not fully lived up to its promise. 
Uh, and uh, lastly, this notion that TILs, tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, were clearly associated with prognosis in a variety of tumors uh, was championed by a close colleague and friend now in Lausanne, George Kukos, who showed that uh, in a New England Journal paper that the single best predictor of outcome in ovarian cancer was the presence of T cells in that tumor. And then in 2010, CTLA-4, Ipi, ipilimumab came along in the backdrop of this extraordinary uh, literature, all of which I have clearly carefully read in preparation for this uh, presentation. Um, this is the kind of dramatic results you can see. This is the first patient I treated with high-dose IL-2 who had alone, who had a uh, really dramatic response. Each one of these are pulmonary metastasis. After a single course of IL-2, all of his tumor in his lung and liver went away. It looked equally as dramatic. The problem is he died two and a half years later of a brain metastasis. And the biggest problem with high-dose IL-2 therapy is that it's associated with a cytokine storm and significant toxicity. And every effort to try and limit its side effects have been remarkably unsuccessful. And I believe now in modern parlance, that's because these patients develop what's called a systemic autophagic syndrome and temporally limited tissue dysfunction. Virtually every organ uh, goes on check. So uh, tumor infiltrating lymphocytes were uh, started while I was still at the NCI and are being, uh, now there's over 600 patients treated worldwide. Uh, responses comparable to the uh, surgery branch experience with about a 50% objective response rate in patients with melanoma have been observed not just there, but in Sheba, in Israel, in um, um, MD Anderson, in Moffitt, in, in Tampa, uh, just on the other coast. And uh, there is efficacy in multiple tumor types, but most of the data is in melanoma. Um, and the response rates uh, over the years with, con uh, with continuous improvement in this strategy, championed by Steve, shown here, um, has been um, uh, really dramatic, where the adoptive transfer of T cells cultured directly from the tumor in the absence of a lymphodepleting regimen, in the presence of a lymphodepleting regimen, and then in combination with immunotherapy uh, or with uh, a whole total body irradiation, has progressively increased the proportion of patients surviving. And if you look, this is not days or weeks, this is months. And so you have patients who are out, over half of the patients, who are surviving uh, longer than three years. That's really remarkable for a disease for which there's only a three to six month um, mean survival. In the most recent uh, study, and I, I applaud Steve and his colleagues for doing this study, a randomized study comparing chemoablative chemotherapy um, uh, to a non-myeloblative uh, chemotherapy uh, with fludarabine and cyclophosphamide, tumor infiltrating lymphocytes plus IL-2 with the addition of TBI, about 101 patients reported at ASCO last year. There was a 54% objective response rate and a, uh, no difference between the two arms except increased toxicity in those getting radiation. And uh, 24 uh, of those uh, patients had a complete response uh, uh, only one of which has gone on to progress. Uh, really remarkable uh, efficacy. And this is, again, the kind of responses you can see to TILs, quite graphic, large fungating lesions uh, that disappear after a single course of therapy. Even brain lesions uh, uh, are responding. Large uh, hepatic metastases uh, disappearing. So a very effective therapy, large uh, cervical, uh, uh, posterior cervical mass uh, disappearing as well. Uh, you can't be on the planet for very long with knowing that there's another kid on the block. Those are genetically engineered T cells. Instead of using the endogenous T cell uh, receptor, you generate an artificial T cell receptor coupling part of an antibody to signaling domains uh, within the zeta chain of the T cell, uh, the CD3 molecule, but also some co-stimulatory molecules that confers uh, on those cells the ability to recognize, after being put into T cells from the peripheral blood, recognize uh, a variety of different targets, but best uh, with CD19 and the companies behind that. Kite, Juno, and uh, Novartis uh, were well um, on display at the recent ASH meeting in San Diego. Um, you're not going to be able to see this, but indeed, uh, going back to TILs, TILs recognize mutated neoantigens. Those can be cataloged, uh, and 
Uh, one very popular one that was reported in Science just a couple years ago is a woman dying of cholangiocarcinoma who had a terrific response uh, to the uh, adoptive transfer of TILs with um, uh, persistence of that cell in her peripheral blood following uh, transfer. This on a logarithmic scale. Um, and the tumor regression observed after treatment uh, was really quite remarkable, both in the lung and uh, uh, the liver. But you can see that there was a uh, recrudescence of tumor in the lung after that initial response uh, shown here. And then the patient was retreated and had a, uh, essentially a complete response of her tumor in response to a second infusion of TILs. And that's all published. So if you want to gray out the whole beginning of immunotherapy, you can. Uh, that's up to you. We now live in the era of checkpoint inhibition uh, with the uh, current uh, champions, including uh, Jed Wolchuk and uh, uh, Tony Rebus and others. Um, uh, these are really changed the, uh, the trajectory of uh, immunotherapy for patients with cancer. Fundamentally, you have two molecules, three molecules that we target. Uh, one is CTLA-4, which is a inhibitory molecule uh, that is cytosolic in the T cell and migrates to the cell surface, and it inhibits the interaction of CD28 with these important co-stimulatory molecules on an antigen-presenting cell. And you can come in with uh, ipilimumab or tremilimumab uh, as inhibitors and block this interaction and unleash a T cell response. The alternative is uh, to target this molecule, PD-1, uh, which interacts with its counterpart on the tumor cell, a molecule that's upregulated. And when you block this, you enhance the ability of this T cell to mediate anti-tumor response. An alternative, and this is a tezolizumab that was approved for bladder cancer in patients uh, treated uh, and championed by Genentech Roche, uh, you can target the inhibitory molecule on the tumor cell. Although recent data suggests that it's not so much on the tumor cell, but on the dendritic cell, the APC, that where it's doing its biology. I'm going to skip over that. I'm going to skip over that. Um, and I'm going to skip over that. Um, I mentioned that we can couple conventional therapies, chemotherapy, and radiation therapy. And in this recent paper from Penn from about a year ago, uh, you can show both first in mouse models and then in humans that combination of radiation therapy and dual checkpoint blockade uh, really markedly enhance the immune response by effectively unleashing a large uh, and increased repertoire of T cells inside the tumor that could be rescued by these anti-PD-1 or anti-CTLA-4 strategies. There are other therapies on the horizon, uh, vaccinia or herpes-based drugs or uh, oncolytic agents, and there's one that was just approved called TVEC, where you can directly inject a, uh, a herpes a virus. I believe it carries GMCSF, and you can see uh, a markedly higher uh, um, uh, response rate and longer median, median overall survival in patients receiving uh, this therapy with direct injection of the virus into the tumor. So I'm going to finish on this uh, one slide and just say there are several issues that still remain in immuno, so-called immuno-oncology. I used to call it biologic therapy or immunotherapy. The street now calls it immuno-oncology. There are immune-related toxicity and management that can be quite severe. Skin, gut, liver, lung, pituitary are particularly uh, notable in the setting of CTLA-4 inhibitory strategies, but also observed uh, with the other checkpoints, PD-1 and PDL one uh, With IL-2, uh, you can see a cytokine storm, very similar to what was seen with the early anti-CD3 antibodies. Uh, this induces substantial organ dysfunction, what I call a systemic autophagic syndrome that we need to learn how to deal with. In some situations, particularly in PDL. It's been particularly apparent in a couple of the uh, antibodies, as well as CAR T cells, uh, and can be in severe cases associated with death. Pseudoprogression is an issue we need to deal with. Sometimes when you elicit an immune response to the cancer, the tumors progress, seemingly, and really it's just the inflammation making the radiographic appearance look bigger, but it's not truly bigger, and that occurs in about 15% of instances. 
Um, we have to learn how to manage these patients, in particular who have cancer and autoimmunity or an allograft or chronic and acute viral infections. We don't know where vaccines are going to fit into this. Patients who are allergic, uh, can they really mount an immune response? Uh, people with brain metastasis because of the closed cranial vault uh, need special care because brain edema is difficult to treat. We need biomarkers to predict who is going to respond to these therapies. And um, particularly for the therapeutic use of antibodies, understanding more about which FC receptor you're targeting and which IgG type are things you need to think about. And that's all I have for you today. I'm going to sit down and let my other panelists uh, do what they do. Thank you. Thank you, Michael, for that very illuminating uh, history from the early pioneering days of cancer immunotherapy. You covered uh, nearly four decades in uh, 20 minutes, so uh, remarkable. Our, our next, uh, and let's save our questions for the end after all the speakers, please. Uh, our next speaker uh, is uh, Dr. Hans Gustav Lundgren, uh, professor and former dean at the Karolinska Institute in Stockholm, uh, Sweden. And uh, uh, Hans Gustav has been a pioneer in the natural killer cell uh, area, uh, both for infectious diseases uh, and cancer. And so without further ado, I'm going to let you uh, hear about his exciting uh, work. So please welcome uh, Dr. Hans Gustav Lundgren. So thank you, Rich, for a very nice introduction. It's, of course, uh, difficult to talk after uh, Mike here giving such a fantastic overview. But I'll cover, uh, try to cover another aspect, and that is the possibility that uh, we have realized over the last decade uh, to use uh, natural killer cells in uh, settings of immunotherapy to patients with uh, cancer. <clears throat> so just to introduce you to natural killer cells, these cells are lymphocytes. They were discovered because of their ability to spontaneously kill uh, certain type, uh, certain tumor cell lines. Uh, natural killer cells, or NK cells, uh, recognize tumor cells in a way that is slightly different from that of T cells. They recognize ligands that are often expressed on many tumor cells, on virus-infected cells, and on otherwise stressed cells, but not on normal cells. And they do it uh, by their activating receptors. Now, activating receptors on natural killer cells are under control of uh, inhibitory receptors, which have MHC class one molecules as ligands. So the ideal tumor cell uh, target for an NK cell would be a cell that express activation ligands in the absence of MHC class one molecules. So you see that the whole recognition machinery is quite different from that of the T cells that Mike talked about. So uh, <clears throat> about 10 years ago, uh, we started to um, think about whether it would be possible to move NK cells into the clinic to combat human malignancies. And uh, <clears throat> we sort of did that uh, in the course of writing a review on this topic. I should say and be very clear about that, that natural killer cells had been in patients before uh, we wrote this um, article. The pioneer, as Mike actually mentioned, was Steve Rosenberg, who used LAC, cell, LAC cells in the uh, early 1970s late 19, or beginning 1980s. And I think most of us would agree that the, his lac cells um, uh, are IL-2 activated NK cells. There had also been laboratories using cytotoxic NK cell lines put into a few patients with solid tumors. And there had been some recent data uh, from um, Jeff Miller's lab uh, using haploidentical NK cells in settings of solid tumors and also in some leukemias. Uh, <clears throat> you can ask why we started to think about this about 10 years ago, and I think we had come to a stage where we really had gained quite significant knowledge on NK cells at this time, and that really set the path forward. Now, we started to think a lot about how you could design in an intelligent way a protocol that would actually work using NK cells 
uh, towards patients with malignancies. And we contemplated about a number of things. One of them was what type of patient group would be selected. Should we go for patients primarily with solid tumors, or should we go for patients with hematological cancers? We also contemplated a lot about whether one should opt towards pre-testing the patient's malignant cells in vitro, for example, for expression of MHC class 1, susceptibility to lysis, or other parameters. <clears throat> Another issue was sort of uh, the source of the NK cells. Uh, uh, you could easily envisage that you could um, uh, get NK cells from peripheral blood, but you could also get NK cells from cord blood. You could generate NK cells from stem cells, or you could use cytotoxic uh, cell lines, essentially NK cell leukemias with retained cytotoxicity, which you had to irradiate and then give to patients. If you would go for peripheral blood-derived NK cells, the question came up whether you should use the patient's own NK cells, autologous ones, or whether you should use allogeneic NK cells. And also, if you would go for using allogeneic NK cells, the question came up as to whether some donors would possibly be better than others, perhaps because they uh, included larger repertoires of alloreactive NK cells not expressing inhibitory ligands for the MHC class 1 molecules that are present in the patient. Another issue that we uh, dealt quite a lot with was how to isolate and prepare NK cells from selected donors. You could use the NK cells directly as a bulk population, but you could also consider sorting them prior to infusion. Another issue was whether you should activate them in any ways prior to infusion whether you should even expand them ex vivo, which is an interesting possibility, um, or if you should rather opt for a more naive repertoire, which would perhaps allow the cells to expand in the patient. We also contemplated uh, about possible risks of uh, too much manipulation of the cells. Would certain types of manipulations ex vivo alter the key properties of the cells, like cell-cell interactions, trafficking, homing, or other abilities of the NK cells? Another issue, if you would opt for allogeneic NK cells, would be that you have to, uh, 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 you have to consider uh, the need for conditioning, just as is the case in many uh, T-cell settings. And there, uh, very much what we were sort of contemplating about was whether you should go opt for a high-intensity myoablative conditioning that would allow for maximal, oh, sorry, I need to go back. Uh, that would allow for a maximal uh, expansion of the NK cells, that would prevent reaction of donor NK cells, that would eradicate regulatory T cells that could interfere with the donor NK cells, and that would reduce competition for NK cell growth factors like IL-15. But of course, the disadvantage is that there are side effects with such a conditioning, and you could therefore uh, speculate whether you could go towards a somewhat reduced intensity conditioning to avoid some of the side effects question would then be would NK cells be as uh, efficient. So uh, <clears throat> uh, finally we came to a conclusion and what I will do now is to describe one clinical trial that we have opted for. We are doing other trials and ever and the next speaker is um, uh, PI for uh, uh, is also PI for NK cell trials uh, and has chosen a slightly different uh, strategy in that trial. Uh, <clears throat> uh, we did all our, our legal work uh, in the time period 2010 to 2012, run several rounds of validation studies in the GMP laboratory, and this is the phase one slash two clinical study that we initiated. So what we finally decided to do was to go for patients with uh, hematological uh, tumors. And one of the reasons for that is that many of the activating receptors uh, on NK cells actually have specificity for hematological uh, cells. Um, and uh, more specifically, we decided to go for patients with myeloid dysplastic syndrome or acute myeloid leukemia. And that would be patients not being eligible for stem cell, hematopoietic stem cell transplantation, would be patients with an advanced, rapidly progressing disease that uh, have been shown to be refractory to all standard treatments and where no other preferable treatment option exists. 
that is a patient group in a rather bad condition. Um, we finally opted in this clinical trial for a leukapheresis obtained peripheral blood derived NK cell enriched product obtained from haplo identical donors. The product was depleted uh, efficiently from T cells and B cells with standard GMP clean and max separation. We decided that we would only activate the NK cells overnight, not allow them to expand, um, <clears throat> and we would activate them with 1,000 units uh, IL-2 per mil, and we set up uh, quality control uh, uh, criteria, including uh, minimal, uh, the minimal, a minimal cell dose of 8 times 10 to the 7 cells per kilo to administer to, to the patients. So uh, this is our final protocol. We decided uh, to go for a somewhat reduced uh, um, uh, fludorabine uh, uh, um, uh, cyclophosphamide conditioning protocol. Instead of TBI, we decided to use an escalated dose of total lymphoid radiation. We decided to use cyclosporine uh, at the third do dose level that we opted for. We would then give our patients an infusion of overnight IL-2 activated haploidentical NK cells at this stage following uh, the conditioning and we decided not to give any IL-2 to the patients because we were afraid of some of the side effects of IL-2 including the induction or stimulation of uh, residual Treg cells. <clears throat> we were ready to start in 2012 and since then, uh, we have uh, included 16 patients in the study. The study is closed. Uh, it's being summarized as we are speaking. None of this is published. Finally, we included three patients with primary AML, 10 patients with MDS AML, and three patients with high-risk MDS. This is a swimmer's plot um, uh, of the clinical response. I will not go through it in detail here due to the limited time we have available, but just say that of the 16 patients that we treated, we saw major clinical responses in six of the patients. Furthermore, three patients with stable disease or minor responses. Very interestingly, these patients with major responses we moved into a condition where they would now become eligible for hematopoietic stem cell transplantation, and five of these patients had been <coughs> transplanted, and four of them are now alive and disease-free for at least two years, probably longer. It was a couple of months since this was uh, summarized. So, altogether, we can conclude that uh, in most instances, administration of NK cells to patients is a safe procedure. Uh, we could detect donor NK cells uh, at day 7 or day 14 by RT-PCR in 10 of 16 patients. Notably, in all patients with complete responses, we did detect donor uh, NK cells in, perifer in peripheral blood. <clears throat> As I said, we had a good clinical response, major responses in six out of 16 patients. Uh, as I said, the donor chimerism correlated with the major responses. Interestingly, we also saw signs of immunoediting. So residual tumor cells from patients uh, with uh, major clinical responses showed enhanced levels of MHC class 1 expression and HLA-E expression, just opposite to what you see in some T-cell therapies, where you quite often, and it's the case also with the checkpoint inhibitors, eventually select for MHC class 1 loss mutants. So all in all, we are very encouraged by these results. We think that a therapy like this can serve as a bridge for refractory patients to a potentially curative allogeneic stem cell transplantation procedure. And of course, as we are speaking, uh, this was, protocol was designed some years ago. We already now see uh, some uh, improvements of this uh, uh, protocol. So by this, I would like to finish by acknowledge some of the colleagues, in particular, um, the persons that I was trained by, Rolf Kiesling, Klaus Jere, and not the least, uh, two excellent physician scientists. Here, Andreas Björklund, who has done much of the clinical work together with uh, colleagues in our lab and Kalle Malmberg, who has been the mastermind of much of the 
thinking uh, from the time uh, point to begin in my lab as a postdoc uh, around 2003. And I should also end by acknowledging the nice collaborations that we have with people here in Florida, including not the least uh, many of our colleagues at the North South uh, Eastern uh, University here. It's always really nice to be here. So thank you so much, Rich. Thank you, Hans Gustav, for uh, uh, sharing that, uh, those very promising clinical uh, trials early. These are very early experimental trials with natural killer cells that, that um, uh, look uh, uh, very promising. And we're going to hear more about how promising the natural killer-based uh, cancer therapies are <clears throat> from another uh, pioneer in the field, uh, Dr. Evan Alici. Dr. Uh, Alici is a professor uh, at Karolinska and um, is uh, a, uh, also, like all of our speakers, a world leader uh, in uh, this field in, uh, of cancer immunotherapy, including particularly natural killer cells. So I'm going to let uh, Evren tell us about his research. So please welcome uh, Dr. Alici. So majority of you sit on my left, I will try to point to that one. Um, so it is humbling to talk after Hans Gustav and Michael, but uh, I'll try to cover a little bit uh, retargeting aspects of NK cells and what we did in clinical trials. Uh, I would like to thank Rich for inviting us. It's a pleasure to be here. And I also uh, would like to thank the World Stem Cell Committee, including Bernie, at the least, to uh, organize such a wonderful event. Uh, with that said, let's go. Uh, this is uh, a, a former PhD student, now an associate professor in uh, Turkey, in Istanbul, uh, sat and analyzed NK cell abnormalities in all malignancies he can identify. He did a literature search, literally, went into meta-analytic depth and looked into uh, what sort of abnormalities are we talking about in NK cells. And the ones you can see, these are color-coded here. Uh, for example, liver cancer, colorectal cancer, AML, CML, myeloma. There are, ex there are extreme overlaps. Neuroblastoma is another overlap. Uh, it seems like we are looking at not only decreased cytotoxic activity, not only defective expression of the activating receptors, namely the proteins on the cell surface of the NK cells that recognize the tumor-associated ligands, but we're also talking about defective NK cell proliferation or decreased NK cell counts, which not ne uh, don't necessarily go hand in hand. So with that understanding, we went on uh, to understand the NK cell therapies that we had at that time, which some of them we realized that we ignore a lot. Uh, immunomodulatory drugs or cytokines that we use or some of the antibodies that exert what we call antibody-dependent cellular cytotoxicity, use NK cells as a major effector cell pool. So when you use an ADCC-inducing antibody, NK cells are the effector population that exerts the antitumor effect in a majority of the antitumor effect. Of course, there are others as well. But also in the, within the autologous setting, we're always talking about, of course, a reduction of tumor mass. So we want our soldiers to be more than the opponent soldiers, right? And we look into short-term activation. There are a lot of clinical trials historically that have been done, as Hans Gustav uh, mentioned as well. We, there have been long-term activation and expansion clinical trials, which has been challenging uh, in different uh, systems, and also uh, since 1995, there have been a lot of genetic modification efforts uh, on NK cells as well as T cells. What has been uh, recently, uh, as Hoge mentioned, uh, looked into uh, was the donor-derived NK cell population, resting NK cells, short-term activated NK cells, uh, again expanded and uh, genetically retargeted. This started after, especially this gained a lot of momentum after the 2002 Perigia Group's publication. 
So uh, I will uh, immediately jump to what we do. Um, we were looking into different T-cell expansion protocols, and we stumbled on this NK cell expansion protocol. That's why I'm sure Michael would comment about the anti-CD3 antibody. Why would you have anti-CD3 antibody in an NK cell expansion protocol? But uh, when you look at the expansion in 21 days, NK cells preferentially took over culture. We weren't really sure if it was the high dose IL-2. Uh, it's not very high, but it's high dose. Or it was the uh, uh, it was a uh, special thing about this medium. We changed. We tried different media, keeping some uh, central aspects of it, and it still is reproducible with different media. We then adapted. Now we're talking about before the advanced therapy medicine products directive was. Uh, applied. So we're talking about 2002-2003. And we started to begin with the end in mind and adapted a closed expansion system before anybody was looking. Uh, and that was a great foresight of my former supervisor, together with Hans Gustav Siraj Stilber. And uh, these are my technicians. I'm very proud with them, of them. Marie Gilliam, who's doing the exp uh, NK cell expansion from one myeloma patient. And this is the final product that is going through the volume reduction in a GMP certified expansion system. And this is being done in the uh, Karolinska GMP facility. We run a phase one clinical trial. This, was, this clinical trial was still, the process was not ready, so we did it in flask expansions. Uh, it was uh, seven infusions in five patients. And uh, you can see one col uh, colorectal cancer, one hepatitis C positive liver cancer patient. I will uh, allude a little bit more on that. Two kidney cancer patients and one CLL. And the, some of these patients got subcutaneous IL-2 uh, with the NK cell infusions, escalating NK cell infusions. Some of them did not. It, the only side effect we saw was one patient that received the subcutaneous IL-2 had a mild cytokine storm. And when we stopped giving the IL-2, the, the symptoms resi uh, resolved. Uh, all it was basically the take-home message was these were terminal cancer patients. All of them got uh, allotransplant as an experimental therapy. They f uh, failed. They got donor lymphocyte infusions. They failed. And at the end, we gave the NK cell infusions. And one of them, is, uh, uh, to my knowledge, is still alive. The others are uh, unfortunately dead. But the liver cancer patient was very interesting. Um, so alpha fetoprotein level is an indirect marker of uh, liver destruction. It still doesn't say much, but you can see day zero is uh, all the transplant here. You, uh, the patient got the DLI. The patient de uh, developed uh, uh, lung metastasis before the second DLI, got the second DLI. Alpha fetoprotein still spikes. And we started giving the NK cell infusions, 1 million, 10 million, and 50 million per kilo. And you can see that the alpha fetoprotein levels plummeted. So the patient died of esophageal viruses bleeding, um, which is a side effect of chronic liver disease, basically. Um, the, the CT controls, uh, the final CT showed the lung metastasis had disappeared, and the autopsy showed that there were no residual tumor cells left. I, I, we think this is very exciting. And this patient didn't have a cure alloreactivity. Uh, the donor patient did not have a mismatch in the HLA recognition. We think this is very exciting, but uh, we uh, couldn't prioritize such a clinical trial yet. I think this is going to be an exciting clinical trial to pursue later on. Uh, my biggest interest, I'm an orthopedic surgeon in the background, uh, so I got very interested in multiple myeloma due to compression fractures historically. And um, uh, I uh, started with myeloma, and when we started, myeloma was an incurable disease. Um, all patients that were diagnosed had an expected overall survival of, median overall survival of four years. And now it's actually getting uh, to a place where we, c we can have 10-year, 15-year long-term survivors. Uh, the novel drugs are actually helping the quality of life and the lifespan of these patients extensively. But still, uh, one out of 160 people are going to get myeloma. And there are a lot of new cases in the US, for example. It's 20,000 new cases last year. Um, survival is still... Uh, there is uh, space to make it better. 
uh, I was interested in the NK cell compartment of myeloma patients. So we, there are a lot of different immune dysfunctions. You should also remember that this is a plasma cell malignancy, and plasma cells often secrete antibodies that can affect NK cell activity. Um, there are increased uh, soluble IL-2 receptors that renders IL-2 therapy uh, very difficult. Um, high levels of antibodies, defective expression of activating receptors, and that might lead to impaired, that might be a causality or we just see impaired NK cell cytotoxicity. Then when we were testing different T cell uh, adoptive transfers, we realized that IL-2 activated NK cells in a syngenic immunocompetent animal model uh, can prolong survival in uh, these mice. We tested the expansion protocol, in this case autologous NK cell expansion, and put them against the tumor. Day 5 should represent more or less the overnight activation, and you can see that there is some cytotoxicity at 10 NK cell to 1 tumor cell ratio, but it doesn't compete with the 20-day expansion protocol. And it is specific. Uh, this, pa this paper was published approximately eight years ago, I think. Uh, we went ahead. It took us eight years to finish the clinical trial <laughs> um, after the discovery. So we went ahead, did a detailed phenotyping. Uh, basically, what you see here is a comparison of the receptor saturation on the NK cells before and after expansion. Uh, above one means the receptor was upregulated, below one means the receptor was downregulated. These are the activation receptors. There is a general trend of upregulation. And the inhibitor receptors, two of them are upregulated. One of the chemokine receptors, CXCR3, is upregulated very interestingly, and CX CCR7 is downregulated, which suggests that these cells will go to sites of inflammation, but that is not uh, conclusive. Um, so, and each patient behaves differently. So you can see the phenotypic changes in each patient. And we were thinking, can we predict the response due to the phenotype of the NK cell expansion? Unfortunately, we can't. We did a lot of blocking assays. Uh, we did single cell response uh, uh, assays. Uh, we still cannot predict this. Then uh, the other approach we were looking at was, uh, so after the first clinical trial, uh, and we wanted to start the myeloma clinical trial, we started looking at how we scale this up. And we calculated it was 285 uh, T150 flasks. If you don't know, that is approximately, yeah, uh, half of that wall uh, footprint-wise is going to, uh, the incubator space is going to cover. And uh, I got a small mutiny in the lab, so we started looking at different ways to scale this up. Uh, we tested uh, view life bags. At that time, Dendrion was doing a lot of uh, DC expansion with view life bags, so we couldn't get our hands on it. We still tested a Teflon gas permeable bag, and it didn't grow well. Then we tested uh, G Healthcare's Wave by a reactor, and that gave a pretty good expansion, comparable expansion to Wave, uh, to uh, static cultures. The more interesting part is it degranulated the cytotoxic activity in Wave was better, and we didn't uh, realize why uh, in the beginning. But then we looked into the correlation of the different activating receptors. Uh, this is a learning occasion, uh, really, for us. Uh, one of the activating receptors directly correlated with the degranulation. And now we realize that it is the shear forces in these cultivation systems. It's not wave specifically. It is this shaking event, the shear force, that upregulates this receptor. It's a physical induction of receptor modulation. So it's very interesting that this can happen continuously. And think about the runners having better NK activities. This might be one of the things we should look further into. So this is the clinical trial design. I wanted to make sure, Hans Christoph is also involved, of course, with this. Uh, we wanted to make sure that uh, the patient is not touched. They're, stand they're going under standard therapy. They just donate a, uh, either a very small apheresis or a one unit of peripheral blood donation. Most patients prefer one unit of peripheral blood donation. And the cells are expanded, QC'd, and frozen until the patient relapses, and almost all patients will relapse, unfortunately. If they don't relapse, we wait 100 days and in, in, inject the cells to the patient uh, to see if, the, if it's safe 
Uh, these are escalating doses. We give 1 million, 50 million, and 100 million cells per kilo. These are the minimum amount. And we, are, uh, we have finished this inclusion. We're waiting for the last patient to reach 18 months now, uh, which should be in, sorry, six months. Uh, the last patient, last visit after, uh, six months after should be in March. And so far, I can say that the cells are safety infused and we see some efficacy. One other thing I want to mention is the antibodies. So we're working a lot with uh, a drug that is called daratumumab CD38 antibody, which is produced by Janssen. And you can see different two patients I wanted to put here. Uh, the patients go under so many lines of therapy. The M component, basically the tumor biomarker, you can see that the patient basically relapses every single time. Um, so when you re-challenge with the DARA, you don't lose the epitope. So why do these patients still relapse? We looked into the NK component and realized that both of the patients NK cells plummeted. So it seems like the effector population that exerts ADCC, and we, can, we have seen this in a series of patients now, the effector population that exerts ADCC is depleted in these patients. I will finish by one last thing. Uh, so we are looking into retargeting of NK cells. We looked into different uh, pathways. NK cells have been inherent, uh, very resistant historically to genetic modification, lantiviral genetic modification. And we were very frustrated by this because T cell gene modification is very straightforward. Uh, mesenchymal gene modification is very straightforward. Uh, you name it, NK cells are the most resilient ones. We tested different envelopes. Tolga, the post, uh, PhD student I was talking about, and Adil basically dedicated years of their lives to figure this out. And uh, at the end, it turned out to be the intracellular pathways, RNA recognition pathways, that were playing the significant role in uh, uh, recognizing the viral particles. Basically, it makes sense. NK cells are there to kill the virally infected cells and to kill the virally transformed cells. So it makes sense that they have inherent resistance mechanisms, viral infection resistance mechanisms that are much higher than other cells. Uh, but it just didn't dawn on us before. Uh, so with this inhibitor for the uh, double-strand RNA recognition, you can see that the transduction increases significantly. But unfortunately, this small molecule had a lot of off-target effects and was partially toxic. Um, so Adil and Tolga went on to, and we looked into different the granulation of the transduced and untransduced cells, we don't see a major difference. We looked into different um, pathways, different comparisons uh, that have been published, and we see that this is very specific. And then we identified, the same gang identified a more specific molecule after a systematic screening that increases transduction even further. BX is the middle one here and the, uh, the new molecule is the right one. And it is not toxic, or it is much less toxic at a very high co concentration. We put this under a Florida company called Vicelix. We IP protected it and put it under a company. Um, we still wanted to do this to understand the NK tumor interactions. So we got this vector, the lantiviral vector, and cloned all uh, non NK cell receptors into this lantiviral vector to understand which receptor ligand interactions are critical for autologous tumor recognition. It's a one sentence explanation, but it is a very big undertaking to code and optimize all these receptors to quality control the expression and to check the SHRNAs, which Mikhail there is uh, one of my PhD students is uh, spearheading this project together with Arnika and Karin. Basically, you test spontaneous release, autoimmunity, and against the tumor to understand the specificity. And these are the type of readouts you would get. For example, this is a very specific one. This causes an autoimmune reaction. One of the positive controls of the experiment was a RNA construct that we wanted to mimic viral transduction. 
And uh, it gave a very uh, unexpected side effect. We were expecting a type 1 interferon response. We don't get any. So we did an array. And we realized that we get a perforin and significant perforin and granzyme upregulation. We still don't understand the mechanism of this. And it doesn't activate the NK cells, but it increases the serial killing capacity of the cells, as uh, shown here. Uh, we also uh, tried to IP protect this and uh, tried to push it as an in vivo delivery vehicle that the same animal model that I was initially mentioning in myeloma, we injected this small molecule, uh, this RNA molecule, to, uh, to tumor-bearing mice. This is standard tumor-bearing mice. And this is basically the small molecule together with the tumor in the tumor-bearing mice. And it increases survival of the mice. So I think it's a promising approach that we are further looking into. With that, I want to acknowledge a lot of people, but I won't take your time. Important people here are Hans Gustav Haret, of course, my team here. Uh, Arnika is here in the audience, uh, Karin. Uh, we have our research nurse, she's phenomenal. We have some MD PhDs uh, that are in the group as PhD students. Uh, Marie has been critical as an RA. Mikkel is a PhD student. Katerina Leblanc, who gave a lecture uh, during this meeting, Otti, and um, uh, as well as Tom Temple, Richard, that has welcomed us. Uh, Tolga has been very important, and Adil as well. We have two companies, uh, Cell Protect, the NK Cell Expansion Company, and y Cellx that I need to acknowledge. And we have a very good collaboration with Sorento Therapeutics that have been very helpful in new retargeting designs. And these are my uh, biggest grant supporters, Swedish Research Council, Vinova, and the Cancer Society. Thank you. Hey, uh, we have uh, time for a few burning questions. Uh, and uh, if we could please have the mics on for the panelists, and we'll keep this one on as well. Uh, so uh, uh, the floor is now open for questions to our panelists. OK, well, seeing none. Uh, I actually have a question, and there's no right or wrong answer, but um, I think it's a very important question, and as world experts in these, this field of immuno-oncology, I'd like to ask each of you your vision of where you see uh, the field evolving into, into the near and far future. So, uh, Michael, would you like to start? Um, thank you. Um, so I started my life off as a cytokine enthusiast with IL-2, IL-4, IL-12, and then a T-cell chauvinist, and then a dendritic cell evangelist. Uh, and as you may have caught on, I'm now addicted to death. I think the fundamental understanding of cancer has to change, that we need to recognize that it's fundamentally cells that are dying the wrong way. Uh, I believe that T-cells play a role in as a broad vision for the future, uh, we've spent the last 100 years taking tumors out. Uh, surgeons everywhere have shown that that's an effective strategy in a subset of patients. And I think rather than pickling them in formaldehyde, we should start thinking of ways where we can extract the immune cells or understand the immune cells at the very least and make that the mainstay of therapy. That would be a, a broad vision for the future that that uh, there's already, I think the one thing we've learned is there's already an immune response to cancer in adult tumors uh, with perhaps a couple of exceptions. And the real question is how to unleash it in an effective way. Thank you. Uh, Erin, would you like to go next? <laughs> okay, Hans Gustav, you're next. So I'm rather optimistic when it comes to um, the possibilities to handle malignant diseases in the years to come, we are getting better and better, and I think that uh, clearly immunotherapy is making, uh, is advancing very rapidly. We don't really know where it will end, will probably not end, uh, but it will certainly have a place, at least in the coming 10 to 20 years or so. 
Um, I think that more and more cancers will be treated by many different modalities, maybe at different stages in disease. We will see more and more of combination therapies. We will not always cure patients from cancer, but we will certainly delay um, death, and it will become more and more of a chronic, handleable disease. Certainly there will be some cures. So I'm very optimistic where immune-based treatment really will be one modality. Thank you. Everyone, you get the last word. Okay. Uh, so if, if I had cancer, what would I do? Uh, right now, I would uh, probably do a TCR gene therapy and uh, get a neoapitope-specific T-cell therapy. Uh, that would be probably the best approach right now. Uh, five years from now, uh, that may not be the best approach. In an and the answer in 10 years from now will depend on a lot of factors, but including the health economic factors. So when we are looking at uh, the reality is, in an academic center, uh, we are doing an NK cell expansion, NK cell gene therapy, and it is not cheap. Once we get to a personalized treatment step, the, each of these patients will get a personalized immunotherapy. If we're looking to that future, we're, we're looking at an expensive future. Uh, we need to figure out ways how this is going to be adaptive, adapted into the common practice in a cheaper manner. We cannot continue the way it is. I am very optimistic that we are coming with solutions. I'm just, I'm optimistic that they're going to get cheaper and affordable in everywhere. Not on the state side, not on the Nordic countries, but rest of the world as well. I'm just not as optimistic that it's going to happen the next five to 10 years. I hope it happens before I retire. Thank you, everyone. So, um, if again, there are no burning questions remaining, I'd like to uh, thank uh, all of our expert panelists and thank all of you for attending. So, thank you very much. <laughs>